What's up, guys? This is the very first show and our grow show of Cash Plays on Quadjax.com. My name is John Kim, and I'm joined by my co-host Joe Tian. Joe. What's up, guys? And a quick background on ourselves. I actually co-hosted Cash Plays on a different site, and we're mostly a strategy-based show. Um, went over a lot of concepts, and our listeners got a lot out of it in terms of improving their poker games. And the original host is no longer around, so I'll be taking over the hosting duties, and Joe will be my sidekick. Um, for those that don't know who I am, I used to be, I used to go by Nicolac online. Um, I'm also a card runners pro, and I also run my own training site. Joe and I run our own training slash coaching site at stackemcoaching.com, and the show is presented by stackemcoaching.com. Um, I was known as one of the most successful mid stakes to semi high level stakes online cash game grinders, playing mostly six max no limit and full ring no limit. Some occasional heads up, some PLO, and some tournaments. And Joe is primarily a live player, um, travels the circuit, or you can just, you can tell us a little bit about yourself, Joe. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you, a, I mean, I'll give you my background pretty quickly. Uh, I've been playing for eight years, uh, full time. I I don't know, most people know me because I play a lot of tournaments and stuff, but I'm, uh, I don't, yeah, I'm the, I'm the four deuce off suit boss. <laughs> That's my new uh, nickname. No, anyways. Well, what, um, why don't you tell people what happened with that hand? What was that hand? What was that hand? Oh, uh, we can get into it. That was recently at the. Well, not so recently. Now, a few months ago at the Epic Joe, Poker. Since you're kind of a, can you raise your mic up a little? Yeah, I, I, I heard the same thing. Okay. All right. Um. <clears throat> yeah, that was at the Epic Poker uh, event just recently, where I knocked out. Um, two people with pocket queens and pocket aces, and they both fell short to my deuce four offsuit. <laughs> I mean, I think I played it like a pro, and I, <laughs> I'm sure I'll explain why later. I don't know if I want to get into it right now. <laughs> okay, basically, you reshoved thinking you had fold equity. The person with queens, Vanessa Russo with queens, and Faraz Jaka with aces was a short stacker. So you figured if Vanessa folded, you're free rolling on Faraz's money and all the dead money. And it was the money bubble. And the money bubble was pretty big, about 50K. So you assumed there was a ton of fold equity. And Vanessa yeah. ended up making a girl call with queens, and you snapped both of them off and busted them. A lot of talk about that hand. So There was quite um, a bit of talk about it. Um, I... <clears throat> You know, I've talked it over with a lot of people, a lot of people that have asked me. Uh, just at the time, I was pretty sure she was going to fold her hand, uh, just based on the way she played it. Um, I didn't think if she had, like, a, a super premium hand that she would re-raise. I thought she would just call. So when she re-raised, I figured she's folding to any all-in. Um, I think she wanted to, but, you know, realized that she couldn't. Especially for, especially because I might have deuce four in my hand, so along with okay. a lot of other things. Okay, so that's basically the backstory from his <laughs> deuce four offhand, and Joe ended up finishing third in that tournament for a three hundred k cash. Um, so he's a prominent player in the online or not online live circuit tournament circuit world, but you don't play as many events as most other pros do, right, Joe? You you do play a lot of cash games. Yeah, I'm I'm play primarily cash games. Um tournaments like I like playing them during the World Series and if there's one uh nearby like I'll go play it, but I'm not like I don't travel too much, maybe one or two poker trips a year. Uh but that's about it for tournaments. <clears throat> uh yeah, okay. so we're we're both like uh John and I are both like really into cash games and I think you know, we really helped each other learn. Uh, you know, guys that know us, like, you know, I always, a lot of the questions I have and with poker, just strategy-wise, um, I'll talk to John and I know vice versa. So um, it's kind of cool. And plus, everyone needs to complain about bad beat stories. So, yep. so basically what this show is going to be about on a weekly basis is covering concepts, hand histories, questions our listeners may have. Um, just ways, advice that we can give. We, <clears throat> we've been professionals for, well, I've been a pro for close to 14 years. Joe's on, what, year eight or nine or so, getting close to a decade. Yeah, nine years. 
Yeah, and years. we've never gone broke, which I think is a huge accomplishment, especially when you hear about all these people going broke left and right, um, especially after Black Friday. And actually, we've made, I think we've all been on a path where we've done better every year. Um, I mean, there are a couple of years when we might have made a little bit less, but so I think we have a lot of wisdom and advice we can share with our listeners on just being a very good poker player and doing things the right way, um, making sure you don't go broke. So, um, so, and occasionally we're going to have guests to talk about specific concepts and whatnot. We've done that with the previous cash game, cash plays show. Uh, it went pretty well. And we answer listener emails and questions you guys may have. I mean, you can even ask us questions via chat that goes on in the quad jacks chat box. So that's be the format of the show going forward. Now, we want to talk a little bit about what's been going on in our lives. Um, for me, it's been a little tougher because of Black Friday. I was primarily an online guy. 90% of my play was online. Um, for Joe, it might have been the opposite. 90% was live, but it, he occasionally played online. Um, we played yeah. all the Sunday tournaments together. Um, he occasionally played some of the six max, six max cash games. So I've had to revert to live games because I live in Las Vegas and I have a family. And Joe actually moved to California. He used to live in Las Vegas, but he got married and his wife lives out there and they're expecting been, a baby soon. So congrats yeah. on that. I mean, it's been a big change for me. Uh, or not, it hasn't been a huge change, but the online, you know, I, I just play a fair amount of online poker. I'm still mostly a, a live guy. Uh, I think the biggest change is moving away from Vegas. Uh, I moved away from Vegas. Um, I, I mean, I'm spending my time like, close to 50 50 now but uh you know i'm spending a lot of time out in california where i play like in a different style of game it's not like the vegas game so uh that's kind of like the biggest change for me well here's a quick question do you think the vegas games are the toughest games around i mean you've been, you've been everywhere in north america you've played cash games and tournaments everywhere yeah like the last few times i went to vegas i was pretty darn surprised at how tough the games were um and i didn't think you know i lived there for six seven years before i kind of moved away and i didn't think that it would be as difficult as it was like i mean the last year or two the, the games in vegas have been the toughest of anywhere i've played for the last couple of years i would say that yeah i think combination of reasons the games are getting tougher because of all the training sites out there including ours stackemcoaching.com and also because of black friday there's been some online guys that decided not to move over broad and just move to vegas or la the big hotbeds of poker and they're playing more live um we'll actually bring on a couple of the guys that used to be online grinders and now they're primarily live cash game players uh, i want to ask you joe about where you live now and you're playing in a we we're talking about this last night you're playing in a new game plo8 um it's basically pot limit betting, uh, Omaha high low eight qualifier. Um, how's that game going? Oh man, I mean that it, it's kind of weird because um, the you know I play in Ventura, California a lot, and the game. You know what? I I wasn't gonna say where you lived because I don't <laughs> want people to flock to, to the game. I know. You I know. This. I'm surprised you gave it away, but that's your prerogative. I mean, whatever. I'm not going to hide anything. So, uh, yeah, that's where I've been playing. And, um, you know, they it's kind of a small card room. They just, like, out of nowhere got, like, a 5-10 no-limit game going. And uh, that game's been pretty popular recently. And then um, just a few months back, they started up a 5-5 with a mandatory, like, $10 straddle PLO. Um, and we're playing half PLO high, half PLO eight or better. And man, I mean, the game is, the game is like a lot different than um, any like no limit game or anything. The game plays much bigger and it's, it's a great game. The PLO eight or better is like, is a really, really great game. It's such a true form of poker, I, I feel like. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, because it's a pretty new game, uh, most people in that area, actually most people in most areas probably don't know how to play it properly. Do you see that going on where you know, I mean, I'm sure you're somewhat inexperienced in the game too, but you have better talent, more natural feel for the game of poker than most of these guys. So you can see the mistakes they're making. So do you feel like when a new game is introduced like that, the games are really, really soft? 
Um, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, that game, there's actually some, you know, pretty decent players that uh, that get in there and play. And it's surprisingly a lot of the old school guys, uh, they really know how to like, they really know like how to bet size pretty well, which I'm surprised. But most of the better players in the game are older guys. Uh, yeah, and actually you told me something that was kind of surprising. You said some guys, some pros from the L.A. area drive up there to play in these games, but once they jump in these games, they're primarily no-limit cash game players. They jump in these games, and you you're, you said you're pretty shocked by all the mistakes they were making. Um, is it yeah, just like, because... Okay, do you want to explain it's why? It's funny when someone asks you, like, oh, do you think so-and-so is a good poker player or... or you know, and, and pretty much there's there's almost no way of really telling how good someone is. Like, obviously, results are going to be skewed one way or another. Um, but like, when you sit at a table and and watch someone play, you can you can watch like obvious mistakes, but you can't like it's hard to see like oh he made a good bet here with this hand or whatever. You know, like you can see a few hands at showdown, but normally you're not able to tell. Um, but in that PLO eight game, uh, a lot of you know, a lot of times when you're turning your hands up and and you're like missing bets, like it's pretty amazing to see. It's pretty you can definitely see that. Yeah, I think you told me one specific hand where a no limit player you assumed was good checked back. Um, what was the hand? Oh, he's he's he gonna said? know I'm talking about. <laughs> so what? He said you're gonna leave everything out in the open. Um, the board was <laughs> ace jack five. It was Six, a uh, ace. Yeah, was, this is all, uh, pot limit Omaha eight, and he checked back heads up, jack ten deuce three. Is that right? Yeah, it was PLO eight. Yeah, you got it right. The the final so board was he, ace ace yeah. jack five six, and so he, he had, had the nut low with the pair of jacks, and he checks it back heads up, which is I already told you, and we both agreed it's a terrible check back. <laughs> uh, who cares if he finds out? I mean, he's screwed up there. I wonder if we're allowed to say bad words on here i don't know but he's but actually he royally good. effed up the hand yeah that, that hand i'm sure he did um and the guy was like under the gun limped and he was just check calling the whole way uh so it was you know kind of okay, seemed we, like you were told we we're allowed to drop the f-bomb once in a while so <laughs> just to make sure <laughs> and there's we people that it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, that's the new PLO game. That sounds fun. I always tell everybody that my least favorite game is no limit cash game because I played so many damn hands of it. Probably over six, seven million hands in my lifetime, um, just grinding 12, 15 tables online for many years, that it becomes repetitive and gets boring. So I like playing mixed games, um, enjoy tournaments more too, but you just can't make as much money because all the money is in no limit hold'em. And now that's PLO. So true. Also. It's so yeah, true. So I mean, the, the other games, I, I just feel like once other people kind of realize how much fun those games are, I mean, like, No Limit will be like a thing of the past. I mean, all the mixed games and stuff, I, I mean, I suggest it to anyone. If there's like a low limit mixed game nearby, uh, get out there and like learn how to play them because it, they're just a blast. And there's yeah. so much, it, it's a lot more thinking than No Limit too. I mean, No Limit has some complex mm. spots and but it's almost know if there's more like thinking. a solved there's, game, I think. Yeah, there's different sets of thinking, ideologies involved in all the different games. But let's get away from poker strategy for a little bit. Let's talk about a uh, little bit of news and gossip. Let's talk about this EDOG 2 plus 2 thread that's been ongoing. It's a huge thread. And the reason why I want to talk about it is we're personally involved in this, actually. Um, oh, man. Apparently, EDOG uh, owes a lot of people in fantasy football leagues from the losses he's amounted uh, on side bets in various league and high stakes league. We're actually involved in one high stakes league with them and we beat him out of a decent amount, five figures, um, back to back years, but we decided it not to like put a brag. Much... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just stating it was the kind of a brag. <laughs> but we are, yeah, it is pretty sweet though. <laughs> okay. So basically, yeah, he, he, amounted a lot of losses this past season and the truth came out that he has no money you and i personally didn't know how much in debt he was i mean it turns out he owes the irs millions of dollars he owes people at least 100k i heard 200k but i, I don't know um 
we have some friends that are involved in some of the leagues with him. So, I mean, he owes a shitload of money to people. Um, and he owes a full tilt, if those reports are true, $4 million or so. That pisses me off because I have a lot of money on full tilt. And that's where I used to grind mostly online. But anyways, um, it turns out he can't pay people because he doesn't have the money uh, in these high stakes leagues. Um, and one of the reasons why we were hesitant to book action with him was because we knew he had a piece of full tilt and that was where he made most of his money. And once Black Friday happened, we, you know, I mean, it took him a year to pay us each time we beat him um, two years in a row. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was, that was the bad part. I mean, it was, we had action with him in the first year. It took him, I don't know, seven, eight months. And then the second time it took him a while. Uh, I mean, I don't like to say anything bad about him. I like him as a person, but, but, you know, the, the way he's handling these situations, uh, I mean, can't he release a public statement just saying, Hey guys, I'm sorry. Um, I have a problem. But, I mean, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? Yeah, sorry. I don't pay back my debts. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's if, a ton if he of speculation them- running rampant because he hasn't said anything, at least come out and apologize. Or at least apologize. I don't think he's even apologized to the people he owes. Uh, I mean, I can name some names, but I'm not. But, you know, guys that are friends that have yeah. told us he owes them money. Uh, I'm pretty sure he hasn't come out and said, hey, I'm sorry, guys, or whatever. So, um, and someone's asking about Erica's tweet. Have you read that her tweet? No, uh, I haven't seen it. I think it's along the lines of, hey, guys, um, my ma- I sent my man out to buy, or I'm going to go buy $20 worth of lottery tickets. And hopefully he wins so he can pay everybody. So chill out. So, which was, you know, inappropriate wow. to say because the amount of sheer money, amount of money involved. So, uh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, it's obviously a touchy subject. And to say that, it's like, I mean, people, that's other people's money that, like, you know, they won fair and square. It's, you know, certain things that go on in the world of gambling, like, especially when you have action like that with other people that you know are gamblers, it's just, you, you have to honor that. I mean, it's, it's like, the issue I have with Eric is, I mean, I, whatever I hear, you know, you're, you're friends with him. You guys went golfing together a few times. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really know him personally, but the issue I have with him is that he had to have known his financial status before booking the action in this past season. So he had to know if he didn't, if he lost money, he wouldn't be able to pay it, yet he still booked action, right? So wouldn't that uh, make him a scumbag, knowing that he's basically free rolling? I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, he could have, like, he could have had action. He could have had a lot of money. He could have had millions of dollars and, and then just lost it, you know, by the time the end of the season came around. So, I mean, you know, I know Eric had a lot of, gambling habits for sure so it's like he could could have had all the money he could have had all the money to be making these bets with and just kind of lost it by the end of the season um so you know i'm not gonna make one assumption one way or another about it but there is one thing that kind of upset you know one thing that pissed me off more than anything is like just pay back your debts i mean it, it you know if you're gonna make a bet with someone if you know you just honor those bets i mean both people are on the hook for it and how Again. do you feel about Daniel's defense, uh, him coming? Or he tried to explain why E-Dog was doing what he was doing. Um, old school versus new school. Old school is basically, we just let anybody borrow money, or we just let people borrow money, don't worry about it, and we'll get paid back whenever. Um, just because everybody knew each other. New school's way is like more prompt and more um, by the books. And people, you know, just... Um, I, I didn't like Negrano's response. He never mentioned E-Dog in his V-blog. And also, uh, this old school sh- BS is, that's, that's what it is, it's bullshit. I mean, uh, we've been around poker long enough, and he tries to justify saying if you've been around poker, you would understand. Yeah, I have been around poker. poker. Yeah, I've been around poker for nine years, and, and I can kind of agree that is how it was. You know, when I first moved out here, and you'd be in a poker room, people you know all the time, it's like, oh, Borrow, borrow two thousand, borrow a thousand here and there, and left and right, people were lending money, just like on the finger. It was like, it, you know, people did it all the time. But was it right not to pay those people back? Like, 
it's like unheard of. I mean, there's a reason why people did that shit because they're always getting paid back. I mean, yeah, I mean, we've lent out plenty of money. Even we have some of the same guys that owes money, and it doesn't make me happy. I mean, if they tell me oh, that's the old school way, I'm not gonna be happy to hear that. I mean, I want to get, I want my money back. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> there is, no, in my eyes, there is no old school, new school way. It's just, you know, if you borrow money, you pay it back asap. Um, and if if you lied or didn't have the money or whatever reason you can't pay it back, makes you a scumbag. Um, that's yeah. just my thinking. But but anyways, all right. So let's actually get into some real poker stuff. Um, we'll have our guest on. We'll talk about. We'll go over a couple of hands, and we'll talk about uh, transitioning from online to live and the difference between online poker and live poker. And these two guys we have on used to be primarily online guys that have had to resort to live poker because of Black Friday, right after this break. James Rosenthal and John Hammer, and most people probably won't know who you guys are, but you guys used to be online ballers. James used to be a uh, coach <laughs> at Lego geeks. Poker. <laughs> used to make videos at Lego Poker, and John was a pretty successful online heads up cash game specialist. Um, James, you actually live in Aria, right? Uh, yeah, I guess right next to it in uh, their their uh, condos or whatever you want to call it, like a high-rise building, essentially. Yeah, we can see the background. looks like a nice place. So you, it's, it's just like a quick nice stroll. Place. Yeah, you just take the elevator down, and you're in the Aria poker room, right? That's it, yeah. yeah so that's pretty that's sweet. Com- that's Never pretty leave convenient. home. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about, well, let's talk a little bit about you guys having to transition from online to the live scene. How, how was that like, and what are the differences you guys see from online versus live? Go ahead, John. Uh, Get away. For me, it was a little more difficult because I was used to playing heads up online. So I had to learn a little bit more about multi-way pots, uh, things that you encounter in full ring games and uh, six max games. And I have been fortunate to play some heads up in the casinos, uh, MGM and Aria. Most recently, uh, later in the night when the games get shorthanded, so that's a lot of fun for me. Um, but ranges are, I think, tend to be you know wider live, which is a big adjustment. Um, people would show up with hands early on where I didn't even put that hand in their range because most people online would just fold it preflop. Um, and then you know just for me, anyways, like hand reading, uh, someone's gonna have like a generally stronger range when they call out of the small blind. Things like that that I just didn't really encounter heads up that much online. So, yeah, it sounds like, it, that sounds like a difference between um, playing full ring and playing short. Uh, a lot of it, I mean, some of it's a difference in live and online, though. But yeah, go ahead, James. Sorry. Yeah, just to add in some things, I think the the main thing for me was getting comfortable at the table. Um, you know, just getting a feel for the game. I know for the first six to eight months or so uh, of playing live, you know, I was playing my online style where I just thought I had such a massive edge over everybody that I could, you know, always like play perfectly in these high variance spots and it just caught up with me. And uh, it takes a big, uh, you just need to like essentially admit to yourself that you just have to play snug full ring poker at these lower limits anyway, the limits I played, 2, 5, 1, 3, and some 5, 10 or whatever. And that's yeah. kind of what's helped me improve the most. How about what someone is saying here, seeing 25 hands an hour is very boring. How, how do we adapt or how did you guys adapt to going from playing 500 to 1,000 hands an hour to 25, 30 hands an hour? Um, I always bring my iPad and have my iPhone <laughs> on the table. Um, it's not... Probably not the best thing for like picking up reads and you know things like that, but if it keeps you at the table longer, it's probably plus EV. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, people. go ahead, James. Uh, I just started learning to talk to people and to enjoy myself more. You know, when I first came to the live area, you know, I thought I was cool wearing, like, a hoodie and... and so you were, uh, like, the prototypical online I, guy. I never really did the sunglasses, but, you know, I was pretty close. And, uh, you know, I was just, like, bored and playing every hand and in my shell. But once I started talking to people uh, and, like, in, really relaxing and be, becoming more patient and just enjoying the whole, you know, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, Joe. I yeah, I, I mean, I say that to everyone that goes to play live poker. I'm like, just just enjoy the whole experience. It's totally different than online. I mean, you, I've met, like, I, I can't tell you, I've met so many people different people that have opened up like new doors and opportunities just playing live poker you talk to people and and just be friendly and i think it helps a lot with your game um i think i think it helps a ton i mean just uh, there's times like you know you're, you're a lot of these people that you know and you talk to and i play with a lot of the same people like in day in day out basis it's like you're friendly with them so in the middle of hands like I, i'll just ask them I'm like what you know what do you got how's it going <laughs> like so you actually utilize all the uh, physical stuff, being able to see them, being able to socialize with them to your advantage, Joe, that's what you're saying. I mean, you know, if I get a tough decision against them, I, I'll, I'll like talk it out with them and <laughs> see what they I mean, see if they I mean, I, I've played with you, so I know you're a talker on the tables. You know, there's talkers and non-talkers, guys that have their headphones on. And I think... Hemma's probably a non-talker with his headphones because I played with him as well. So you look like, like a typical internet guy playing live for the first time too. So, but I agree. I think if you're on a table live, you really need to focus on your opponents. Um, you pass time that way. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's boring. I mean, I should know because I used to play more hands than any of you guys per hour. I think I was playing at my peak close to 1,500 hands an hour and. And now I'm reducing that to 30 hands an hour. So I've had to find ways to make it not so boring. And the way I've gone about that is just to try to focus on every little thing going on. Um, I mean, yeah, it's hard not to look at the cocktail waitresses or the, the game on TV. But if you really want to maximize your win rates, you really have to focus on everything that's going on the tables. And the best time to do it is when you're not in a hand, when actually it could be the most boring time. But that's the best time when you pick up little things here and there is to watch other players and observe every little thing they're doing. Yeah, so, I know. Uh, One thing specifically that John, that John was mentioning, it's like, You'll just watch guys who just never, ever value bet the river. And that's one thing in live poker you see a ton, especially with, like, it kind of, like, more fish or whatever. They just – they'll just never value bet the river. And so, like, some people who play – you play against like that, it's just, like, they're either bluffing or they have the nuts. Like, there's a lot of players you see like that, I think. Why is it okay. that they always have the nuts, Joe? They always <laughs> yeah, have I mean, the nuts every time. You gotta call at the right times, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we all agree generally live is easier than online. Well, I guess I don't know if Joe knows he doesn't play as much online, so, and he always wins everything. So, um, but us three agree live is easier than online, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, mean, just, I think so too. I think so too. Line yeah, just because people are more technically sound online, they have their fundamental games. Um, also, you just have longer to think about your decisions, and you're making less decisions per hour, so you're under less of a, a mind crunch. Yeah, um, so let's talk about win rates w really quickly. I've studied s about win rates um, online and live. Online, a good win rate would be anywhere from 2 to 3 BB per 100 hands. So... Um, if you're around three or four, and th I'm just assuming kind of like smaller to mid stakes, obviously for micros, you can probably get to four or five, and at no higher stakes, one or two might be considered really good. Um, so for that's how it is for online, but, li but live, let's just assume two, five, or five, ten, that's like the most standard game. I guess maybe one, two, one, three is, is the most popular game, but um, most of us are at least two, five, or five, ten players. So... What's a good typical live win rate nowadays? Um, at the 1-3 games, probably 10 to 15 BBs per hour. Um. So that's like three, four times more than the online counterpart, right? Yeah, that, I mean, that seems like a lot. 
Yeah, so when you when you're comparing that to the like the online, it seems like a huge difference. It is. The main reason being again, the games are softer. So uh, one of the things that I've noticed I've had to kind of improve my game on is how to deal with limpers because you never see that online, right? And not in six max games. Um, occasionally you might see it in some online foreign games, but most of those are labeled as fish anyways. But live, you see that all the time. People are limping. Um, even like decent players are limping. So... How do you guys combat all the limpers, all the limping going on? Because that's something that I kind of had to figure out ways to uh, exploit. I just wasn't used to it at every hand that when I was playing live. Um, I don't know. I can I can tell you how I play, and it's like I'm always looking for opportunities to isolate limpers. Uh, and you know, I it, it reminds me of the time I was sitting behind you, Hema, and. Like we were, we were kind of, we were, he was, I was sitting, standing behind him, uh, just talking to him for a while. And he was, it was like, I mean, I could tell you about the hand real quick, but like someone, someone limped in or maybe one or two old guys limped in and he was in the cutoff with King 10 offsuit. It was not in the cutoff. <laughs> it, was, it was totally the cutoff. There was no way I was in the cutoff. And so he's like, you know, well, you know, you got a guest there. Someone's someone's here watching you, and and it's like, you know, we're just we're chatting. So he's like, all right, I'm just gonna fold. I'm gonna try to avoid these marginal spots, right? And that's you know. So I asked him, I'm like, I'm like, well, what are you doing? Why are you folding? Like you have king ten, like two Broadway cards. <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, it's kind of marginal and blah blah blah. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I don't really think it is. I think that's like. You know, these these limpers are just, they're limping with everything. I mean, this is, it's live poker. They limp with everything. I mean, 10-4 suited and, like, I mean, you can't just name the hands. Like, people just limp with a lot of hands. So I told Hema, like, if you're not raising there to isolate, like, you're just, I think you have to be taking taking advantage of all those spots. Like, anytime limpers limp, I'm always trying to take advantage of it um, and gain control of the pot. I mean, maybe... Yeah. I, I think most of the time, um, especially since we come from online backgrounds, we tend to try to seize initiative when we can because we're taught that the two most important thing in poker, winning poker is initiative and position. It's not your actual hands. And Joe and I l live by that ideology. We have always have in No Limit Hold'em. Um, it doesn't matter what our cards are. It's just playing position and having control of the hand. So in, limp, in live poker, I mean, there's so many opportunities where you can do that. And the thing about live poker is people come to gamble. It's not like online poker where you, people sit down and they try to play close to perfect or um, game theory optimization. Live, people are there because they came to play poker. They don't want to fold, you know. So yeah. um, they're always limping in. I mean, I've seen, I'm playing 5-10, I've seen some crazy hands exposed. Uh, people limping in with king four off. Uh, shit like that that you would never see online or rarely see online you see more live also uh the other thing about live is that generally um it's usually uncapped not uncapped but it, it, the buy-ins are capped at a bigger are bigger so uh, we have to play deeper a lot more too um so whereas online is mostly 100 bbs live could be anywhere from 100 to a thousand BBs, and we've seen people stack off, like hands. You people online players never stack off for a hundred BBs, right? Yeah. People stacking off five hundred BBs. Um, I remember playing five ten. I think I told you this hand, Joe, a few months ago. Limp pot. Uh, I had I think ace three of clubs in the big blind. Five ten. I was probably like six k deep, and I had some old guy stack off for close to four k on a three club flop. And I had the nut flush. And I can't believe he put in six uh, We went five or six raises on the flop. And he ended up having a 10 high fl or nine high flush. So he, he put in 360, 370 BBs in a limp pot with like the fifth nut, fifth wow. nut flush. Uh -huh. So, uh, I mean, you'll never see that online. So th the thing about live is, you know, you play deeper, people stack off lighter. Um, it's just generally it's softer and. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the g games are always a lot softer. Um, just playing live poker, but 
I mean, I think that's the biggest the biggest difference you see is just the so many people limp calling and wanting to play pots, like, and just how did, how do we adjust to that? <clears throat> I was playing the other night at Venetian. Um, actually, Jeannie, my wife, was sweating me just like the first time in a long time because she was bored. And there was a guy that was limping every hand. We were playing four-handed because it was like two in the morning. A guy limping every hand, calling all my raises out of position. And he beat me out a few hands. And I told her, if this guy stays around long enough, he's going to go broke. But there's no way. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you're always limping and giving up initiative, you can't beat the game. It doesn't matter how good your post flop skills are. Yeah. And what happened was this kid ended up going broke. Not to me, but to someone else. Um, he went broke when I had aces. I had, I had aces to hand, but someone else flopped top two pair, which kind of sucked. So yeah, was, and I think I think that brings up like a really important concept is like three betting in live poker. And you know, people ask me a lot about that, and I'm usually pretty aggressive. Like when I played online, like. I was I was pretty aggressive, like I three bet a lot, but like in live poker, I don't think it's nearly as necessary to three bet. Um, like I don't really three bet all that much in live poker at all. Uh, yeah, you don't have to. So. Yeah, and exactly that's the, that's the reason why it's like you you just don't have to like don't you know why why try to like re steal and try to win small pots pre flop when people are just gonna they're. The reason you three bet pre flop is to to gain aggression and gain the initiative and have control of the pot. I mean, in live poker they're just limp calling everything, so you're gonna have control of the pot when you have like the best hand. Like I wouldn't be three betting light and try to like isolate a guy with a better hand. Like, you know, they, that's a spot where it doesn't matter how much like aggression you're gonna have or initiative. They're just gonna have the better hand most of the time, and and it's gonna be hard to overcome that. Yeah, I want to ask James and Emma, like, wh what are some of the things you guys had to do to make that transition from online to live after Black Friday? Uh, get a bankroll. <laughs> 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 I mean, I didn't have, like, any money online, so that took a little while. Uh, or offline, I should say. Uh, but, I mean, like I, like I was saying before, patience and just, like, emotional control is my big issue. Um, I mean, when I got stacked live, I would get furious, and my my whole plan. You know, if I got if I lost five or six buy-ins online, um, that didn't really change my mindset at all. You know, whatever. If I get stacked once live early on, I was just uh, furious, and like I would play every hand, and you know, I, I would always have to try to chase my losses or whatever. So. <laughs> Was it because online you're playing so many hands and you just feel like, well, I can just win it back because I'm seeing 1,000 hands an hour, whereas live, if you get stacked, I mean, it could take four hours until you play another big pot. Is, is that the reason why you might have gotten tilted? Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, I was, uh, you know, like some of the people in the chat here, I was playing 24 tables when I was playing full ring, and I just knew that. I sat, if I sat there for another 42 seconds, I was going to get aces or kings again and, or hit a set or, you know, hit a flush or something. So it just didn't matter to me. But live, yeah, like you said, you don't know how often it's going to come. It might not come for, might not come the rest of the session. You might not just not even flop a pair for the rest of the session. So it would get, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's gone through it, um, chasing their losses live, you know, not playing their normal game. So getting over that threshold was definitely huge in my my live poker. Okay, so you used to 24 table online? That's, a, that's, that's crazy. crazy. Low. Times, JK, but it's <laughs> Did you tie or cascade? I'm always curious. I didn't do either. I stacked. So it just looked like I was playing one table. It would just come to the front. You know what I'm saying? And if I ever had like a tough decision or something I wanted to see, I would just pull a table aside. But really, you know, I just stacked them. Wow, 24. I, I tried stacking. I gave up after the first hour. Was, now, can you ever, like, wouldn't, would, a new table wouldn't pop up until you made your decision? Is that right? Right. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I was worried because, like, like, the fold button on one table is right behind the fold button on the other table, but the new table wouldn't pop up until you make a decision on the first one, right? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and you're, But you're playing mostly full ring games, right, James? Yeah, yeah, fuller. I, I gotta imagine it's gotta be like almost impossible to twenty-four tables six max games. <laughs> That's just. Yeah, I mean, it, it's because yeah. it's those games break more often. The full ring games seem to uh, not break. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 
six, six, when you're playing six max, 24 of them, they're, you know, a lot of them are going to be two or three handed. And that, that, that's when it gets tough. And you, f you found yourself not making that many mistakes? I mean, no. 24 like, tables. Amazing. That's, yeah, that's crazy. You're playing like a, I was playing like a 16, 12 or something like that with like a 5% three bet. So, I mean, 98 or 98% of the time, my decision. Yeah, but like, still, oh. you're still seeing, uh, probably what, like 1500 hands an hour, maybe more. Yeah. I mean, yes. You were probably playing just as quick. Uh, so how do you not pull your hair out when you're playing live nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> like I, said, I played, <laughs> I played six tables online. That was, that was my peak was six. And I watched you can barely get two tables going, Joe. I've seen you play. <laughs> no, you... I did four. I did yeah, four, and then my peak was six. Like four. when I was yeah. doing. Yeah, time it out with four tables. So. I was. <laughs> I mean, six was my peak. Like I, it was not bad. But I watched you do fourteen. I was like, wow, that's just amazing. Like twenty-four is. It's because I'm Asian. We're good at multitasking. <laughs> Whatever. We're good at click. Oh, dude, it's all the video games in our blood. All bad multitaskers think they're good at it. <laughs> I'm going to play like eight tables of heads up. You know, yeah, that's too. How, I mean, how do you, what did you do, Hammond? Did you tie or, you tiled tables, right? Yeah, I would tile. Um, the most I think I ever did was six. Uh, maybe with like a seventh if I had like a fish on another table or something and I was trying to figure out who to quit. Um, but yeah, six is the max I think heads up for me. Okay, so my question to you is, how do you go from playing heads up to playing live full ring? I, I mean, that's a bigger jump because James was playing f full ring, so he was used to playing against eight nine players. How do you go from playing one player at a time to eight nine players? Um, it was a big adjustment. I think uh, I sweat some friends, uh, including you, uh, playing six max and full ring games, which was a big help to me. And then I talked to Joe uh, a ton about different situations. Um, as they would come up or hand histories, uh, that also helped a ton. Um, but I think I was uh, fairly good at hand reading, um, at least in the heads up pots uh, when I was playing, which was a pretty solid background to build off of. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think, wanted to. Uh, I think with Hema, like, you know, the biggest thing, er, both Hema and James, like, a lot of times when I talk to him, it's like, I think the biggest thing I got to keep reminding them, it's like, it's like, just get it in good. Like, how'd you get the money in? You know what I mean? When they're like, oh, I lost. It's like, oh, well, how'd you get it in? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I mean, that, I think that's the biggest thing I like, you know, when I talk poker with both of those guys, it's like, get it in good. It just it seems so yeah. easy. Yeah, I, I think this kind of, kind of touch up on the next question I have is, what do you think the biggest mistake online players make on a live table? Or something they make frequently that's hurting their game. The biggest mistakes that people make at a live table, at a flooring table? That no, online, players sorry, make. online players make. If their background uh, primarily I just think online. they play too aggressively. Um, the live games aren't nearly as aggressive as the online games. Uh, online, there's much more three betting, four betting um, dynamics going on. And it may be correct to get it in a little lighter because of that. We're live. Um, especially at first for me, I think I thought I was running into the top of someone's range over and over again, when really it just turned out maybe I was getting it in a little too light, um, and the games weren't really aggressive enough to dictate that style of play. Yeah. What about you, James? What do you think the biggest mistake online players make transitioning to live? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's just it right there. I mean, if they, they all know how to play, like, or most, I would say most winning online players know how to play solid, fundamental ABC poker. But they just can't help themselves live. Like they don't, they don't really understand live ranges as much. They don't understand that people limp ace king and limp call, and like they value cut themselves maybe spots they don't really need to. Just something that you can kind of get a feel for after you play a lot. And that's not to say you shouldn't be a value betting thing, because you know you obviously are looking for all those spots to do it. But I mean, it just comes down to they play too aggressively. Their patience isn't there. Um, do you think it's because? They're just cocky. They have an ego. Sure. Because I mean, people know, yeah, people know if, if you're an online player, you're just considered like the best of the best. And you come sit on a live table and they're just laughing and say, like, I'm an online guy. I should be able to run over this table, blah, blah, blah. Especially young guys that haven't really, ex don't have life experience and don't know how to be humble. I'm not saying that applies to you guys, but in a way it does. But 
No, I mean, uh, it's funny because now I, I, uh, when I'm playing, I see those guys come in sometimes and I'm like, damn, I used to be like that. Like, I, and I hate them. I hate those guys. I feel like I'm the old guy that's <laughs> like, oh, these young punks, like, I'm going to get you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's an adjustment period. Yeah, yeah I, I think the one thing Joe and I have talk about, I think the reason why I've, we've done so well over the years, we've never really had an ego. I mean, I haven't. I can't speak the same for Joe, I guess. I got but... a huge ego. I can't <laughs> help it. I mean, I can't help it. I never used to have an ego, but and poker does that to you. <laughs> I mean, nobody <laughs> has a freaking luck box horseshoe stuck up their ass like you do, Joe. So, <laughs> and win everything that you play. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I seriously, uh, thing, uh, JK. <laughs> in all seriousness aside, um, I mean, we're humble enough to affect the fact that you know we have to keep getting better. And if you think you just come sit down and you think you're just going to run over the table, then you're in for a rude awakening most of the time. And that's what some of these yeah. online guys do when they come play live for the first time. And I would say that's the biggest mistake they make. It's just having this mentality, yeah, I won at X win rate online. So there's uh, live poker should be no trouble whatsoever. And, you know, like one guy um, just mentioned in the chat box, he just waits for these guys and waits for – you know, really good hands and picks them off when they try to three barrel them off a hand. And so, and that's something that you know, online players they just they have to make that adjustment. It's just uh, realize that they're not going to be able to run over the game set like they did online because people are just calling so much more lighter on every street too. So again, people are there to gamble. So, yeah. uh, so are there any other important differences that you guys want to mention? Online versus live, or did we cover everything, pretty much? Yeah, maybe just dress a little nicer, get rid of the sweatpants look. You know, no deal. No deal. You know, I know, John here. I, I'm transforming a little bit. I used to just be all Jordans. Now it's uh, I try to put some jeans on. So you know, hey, there's ladies walking around the casino. You never know. <laughs> How's that going for you, James? Pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll stick to the sweatpants. I like to be comfortable whenever I'm playing, so. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I have a girlfriend. I've grown out of that phase. I'm, I'm, wearing, I'm up to jeans now. Jeans and okay. t-shirts. <laughs> All right, well, let's get to a couple of hands now since we have uh, some of these online ballers here. Actually, someone is asking about a hand. I, I don't know if this is the real Sorel Mezzi or not. Asking <laughs> to play a hand. LAPC, should we answer his hand question first? I don't know. Is that him? He probably owned me, I'm sure. <laughs> did you play with them in the LAPC? Yeah, I did play with Sorrell. Um, what did he? I think it was day three he ran it up, or day four maybe something. He was like super short and then just ran it up day four or something. I don't know if that's really him. I doubt it. He has to sign on Twitter, so I'm pretty sure it's him. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Marco's saying, up, Sorrell? why is it that hard to believe? He's in Vancouver, he's hanging out, playing online. That's okay, it. so what's this hand you played against Sorrel Mizzy? And it's I'm not it sure which which hand he's talking about. He's pro it's probably, um, I forgot. I, it, it's probably the one where he owned me because that's probably why he's bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> I would just assume it's not like Joe. How about that hand where? He, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he three bet me, or he raised a cutoff, and I three bet on the button with a six. And um, everyone folded. <laughs> yeah, everyone folded, and he called, and the flop was like um, king king. Oh man, I can't remember the flop. It was like king king x, and it was a pretty bad line that I took. But he check called like a decent size, or kind of a smallish bet, and then the turn was a uh, the turn was a jack. So the board is king king six turned to jack. Or no, no, there was no six on board. I didn't have a pair. It was king, king, x, turn was a jack. Uh, he check called the bet on the flop, and now he, like, let into me small on the turn. So I'm like, uh, I'm going to take one stab at it. Like, I'm going to try to raise on the turn and try to not really representing much. But <clears throat> I'm like, well, maybe he's just got a small pair and wants to, like, maybe he's got, like, sevens, eights, nines, where he can check call and, like, wants to bet the turn. So... I decided to raise on the turn. Um, he called my raise, and 
I just gave up. The river card was a 10. I do remember that. So the board was king, king, four, like turn jack, river 10. And um, he led, in, led into me small again. Um, and I just didn't have the... I, I couldn't, like, pull the trigger or anything, so I just folded. Like, and, and I had to show him my hand, so I, <laughs> I had to fold and show him my hand. And he led, like, super small on the river. Um, so I was just like, damn, I can't really do anything. I was... So basically, this hand is just Sorrel only. Yeah, you I mean, there wasn't much pop. to it, but it, he was just, yeah. I think he just wanted to, I'm not sure. I think he, he wanted, wanted me to bring up a hand that he owned me, or that I, <laughs> that he just owned me. What is this about showing hands? I, I mean, for people that don't know, people paid you to show your hand every time? Yeah, uh, well, Sorrel, a couple of times I've been at the table with Sorrel, like, um, I, did something with him once at like Epic Poker. He paid me like four hundred dollars or something, and then we were deep at the LAPC together, down to fifty. He's like, him and another guy both paid me two hundred. I'm like, you guys are crazy. Like this, inf I I really don't think the information means all that much. Um, so I gladly accepted, <laughs> and I showed him anytime I could show my hand, I had to show it. For what was the total amount you got paid? Four hundred. Or one to five hundred, yeah, yeah. four hundred bucks for that day. And this is what day three, day four. Yeah, it was like uh, day. It was day three or day or day four, I think. Day four. So basically, you don't think it matters if. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't playing. matter. What's it matter? I mean, <laughs> is he gonna see a hand and and see? Oh wow, Joe bluffed, and now like, now next time he's like, oh, I know Joe's capable of bluffing, like. Does that matter? I mean, he he always knows I'm capable of bluffing. Like at any time, I don't think I think each new hand is a new occurrence. Um, I think in your case, there isn't as much value in people paying you to see your cards, just because you play so many hands and you could have anything at any point. So it's not like you're a nit and they can see your. I think I think the only value for them is like if they see things that I'm doing and they're like, well, I know that Joe wins and I know that Joe's done well and. So maybe they can like, kind of what input it learning. in their own game. You know what I mean? They so can kind of place those they, things in their own game. I'm pretty sure they weren't paying you for that reason. But yeah, no. dude, they're just they're just <laughs> learning. Learn, learn, <laughs> play with the pros. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, they're, no, just, I, they're just learning from the best. I mean, I, I don't know what else it could be. Yeah, they're <laughs> definitely not paying you to learn from you. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> that was if you think that's the reason, then you have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't think of any other possible reason. <laughs> I'm trying to see how you play, not, not to learn, but to like exploit you, pretty much. Uh, I don't know if they were able to do so, but. <laughs> um, but all right, let's get to actually. Uh, um, we're gonna answer listener calls or call-ins or questions and. The chat box, but since this is our very first show, I just took one off of our forums over at our site, Stack Um I'll just read it, and I want to get your guys' input on this hand. Not a specific hand, but I just want everyone's thoughts. Let's say a typical 1-2 game with average stack sizes no more than $250. If a hero has kings or aces, bets an amount that does not give call callers proper odds for set mining, but they call amount the amount anyway with the assumption that they would get my whole stack when their set hits. Flop comes a non-threatening ragged rainbow f flop, yet villain hits their sets. How can hero counter this? Are we at the point that we're just relying on reads of villains and then texture of the board at Turner River? Um, basically he wants to know how to combat people that are calling with small pairs and trying to set mine against you when you have over pairs. Um, I guess I'll comment. Uh, Marco said in chat that your head looks dangerously close to that window, which we were all laughing at. Um, but yeah, if, if people call too much in poker, uh, what you do is you just increase the price of poker. Um, so, you know, you just make it expensive for them to do what they want to do. If they want to call too much with small pocket pairs and crack your over pairs or top pair, top kicker, uh, you just make it really expensive for them to do that. <laughs> Mark got a comment for all of us. Uh, our look, our room. So, um, I guess you're in a prison, Emma, or is it? It could be. It no, could be. Good. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, in order to combat set mining, people are calling raises. Uh, James, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. They're going to stack me every time. I don't fold over pairs. But, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> when it comes to, like, yeah, I mean, just increase the price. Uh, just I think – And, I mean, it comes down, like, he mentioned on the right, you know, right up, like, you know, it, it should come down to reads a lot of the times when you're talking about over pairs on a dry board in a live setting. Um you know, it's just going to be player dependent, and unfortunately, that's the question, the answer to a lot of like uh, poker questions. But yeah, if you're talking about how to combat that, then sure, just raising more preflop and raising more hands. Like I, I think, um, you know, you can't really combat it, combat it that one hand. I mean, that one hand, it's like okay, you're going to have to go on your read. Does this guy have a set, or does he not have a set? But in the long run, in other hands, where you're three betting. Or you know you're if they're limping and if they're limp calling a lot and now you get to see bet with air the times you don't miss and they're folding hands that are better um, that's how you're gonna that's how you're gonna combat those things in the long run I mean in that one given hand where you have the over pair and they flop the set it's like I mean how do you combat that well I mean who knows what to do in that one given hand you know because anything can happen but like in the long run I think that's how you combat it it's by winning yeah. a lot of the small ones. Right, and you just need to have a wider range. Don't don't wait for aces or kings before you raise preflop. Ha, be raising with jack ten suited, eight nine suited, pocket fours, um, ace five suited. If you're raising with those ends, sometimes you're gonna whiff. And if people are always trying to set mine with small pairs, uh, they're doing so unprofitably because even if they hit their sets, you're not always gonna pay them up. You're probably just gonna see bet and fold to a raise. So if you're only raising preflop with aces or kings, yeah, that's very exploitable. Um, you should almost always set mine versus those guys because you know they'll probably stack off whenever you hit a set. The other thing is, <clears throat> we're talking about numbers. We had this discussion before the show. Is what are the odds you need to properly set mine? And I said it's 13 to one. Um, the odds of hitting a set is what eight and eight and a half to one to flop a set. But the true odds of breaking even over the long run is you need 13 to one on your money for those times when the guy doesn't have an overpair, and you're not always gonna. Uh, double up through them. So I think that's a good number to have. If you raise, say, 10 bucks and someone three bets to, say, 30 bucks, you need 13 times $30 um, to call profitably, whatever, times 300. Um, 13 times 20. Okay, yeah, 13 times 20, sorry. So $260 more behind to call profitably. Um, so that's a good number, just to remember that, 13 to 1, um, to properly set mine, just to break even. Uh, this is actually based off of online hands. So live, I would probably say the number could be a little lower because players are generally worse live, and you know, they're more likely to stack off with top pair over pairs more frequently. And so I, yeah, and I think that's a big thing that um, a lot of people don't do enough of. Like when playing live, it's like when you're when I'm thinking about defending against the three bet, it's like. Who three bet me? How easily are they going to stack off? And I mean, like, yeah, if it's a very bad player that three bet me, and and like, we're assuming you know we're we're deep enough, I'm going to defend like pretty much any two, you know, because I know that in the long run that's going to pay off. Like, it pays off big. Like, so I'll I'll defend any two against like a bad player that three bets me, um, assuming you're deep enough. And then I think that's like a huge thing in in live poker. Uh, that you see a lot of it's just you know spots like that i mean they're kind of few and far between where you get these massive gifts from like fish with over pairs but um i think you have to go after those spots for sure that's super important to uh stress the fact that you're saying you're super deep because like that's like the worst thing you can do at one three and two five i you know i don't think you can like you have to be really deep because you're never usually that deep at those limits so i mean i would yeah five ten and and up where you play mostly, you're playing what three, four hundred big blinds deep a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm hardly ever like what, if you go to a typical casino in Vegas, where you're at most usually two hundred big blinds deep at most, and you know if you're defending any two, it's probably gonna cost you more in the long run. Yeah. No, I guess that yeah, I guess that's a good point. I, I forgot a lot of the, like the one three and two five games are a lot shallower buy-ins. Um, I guess I was thinking more deep stack. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap it up for this first show. Um, good stuff, guys. So, 
Um, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, like the format, next time we're going to try to do the hand history or poker question discussions before we do the interviews, but since we had our experts, our coaches over at Stack and Coaching, um, we just decided to talk about the online versus live transition before we got into the hand histories or poker questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of things before wrapping up. Um, those, anybody out there that's interested in coaching can always come over to our site at stackhamcoaching.com and so far we have Nick Devella and I are offering coaching services and one of the guys I was coaching recently and this is going to be a brag on my part so um, for tournaments he actually ended up going down to the World Series uh, circuit event in Rincon I think that's San Diego area in California and being an event for 30k so um, coaching does help even though it can get expensive at times but as long as you know there, there's good coaches are out there and I think all of us can attest to the fact that um, coaching is a great way to improve your poker game um, and generally it's kind of expensive but I think our site offers a reasonable alternative to get it for cheap for those that really do want to improve their games or are serious about the game. Anyway, the student's name is the guy that just banked the tournament, Dan Nadarelli, so I want to give props to him. He actually made two final tables this past weekend and won an event for 30K, and we had a two-hour discussion last week, so um, it's definitely paying off. Um, and you can follow any of us on Twitter where we talk about our baller lifestyles, so <laughs> grinding live poker, and Jill travels the circuits and plays cash games while the remaining three of us um, plays live poker around town. Occasionally, we'll still dabble in online on the Merge Network. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so my Twitter is at Neglect Poker. Joe's at Joe Tihan. At Joe Tihan. James is that? Tihan, at dude. Where'd you get Tihan? <laughs> it's Tihan. I mean, how long have you known me? Tihan. <laughs> I, I had it at O N for the longest time in my phone. I don't know why. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay, your Twitter is at Joe Tihan. <clears throat> James is at James. <clears throat> Rosenthal is J A Y M E S R O S E N T H A L. Um, it's kind of weird. It's spelled with the Y, and. <laughs> John Hemmer is at Hemakuda, H-E-M-M-A-C-U-D-A. -M -M and again, my spelling is at N-I-C-O-L-A-K, poker. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was fun, guys. So I will see you guys next time.